time. Uh, I thought I'd just drop. Sandwiched between the mighty Manchester and the mighty Liverpool cities is the town of Wigan in the beautiful Lancashire countryside. A proud, passionate folk with a fantastic, terrific sporting community. Not only in soccer, football, but also rugby league. Today, we have two natives from the town of Wigan to share some of their experiences and stories with us. David and Keith Mayer are co-authors of the best-selling book, Gold Dust. David, Keith, thanks very much for joining us here at Sporting Denver. Thanks, Rich. Appreciate thanks. you having me on. Thanks, Rich. Hey, uh, got to shoot straight from the hip, gentlemen. Um, the book, uh, it's a terrific read, fantastic read. How did it come about? Well, it started 15 years ago, Rich. I started to to uh, formulate, get some information and knowledge, which I thought I had a, a sufficient amount back then. But I couldn't get past the first chapter. Uh, I was trying <laughs> to clarify to myself, you know, and justify why I had the knowledge and experience and, you know, the, uh, the ability to be able to put together a book. So I parked it. Uh, as I said, I couldn't get past, past the first chapter. And then in May of last year, I was in London. Uh, in fact, I was traveling back from London. Right. I've been on a course and I'm traveling back by train. David's heading back to the States. He'd been uh, with me. And I got, yeah, you know, listen, this this flash of, uh, it was like a eureka moment. This is happening. Uh, and a, the book came to, to fruition. It, it then came alive and within a, within that three hour trek of traveling back from London to where I live in the Northwest of England, uh, I'd rang David up. I put together a little bit of a plan on what the book's going to look like. Uh, sure. Then I rang David and I just said, listen, I'm going to write a book. Uh, and I, uh, and I, <laughs> out, of, out of the blue, he said, well, I'll help you. Uh, and so uh, all I basically done rich in this particular experience has just been a I've been a support act uh, as David is he's done most of the work I've sort of provided I've been a supplied the ammo if you like I've my passion right. been reasonable I've left it with David a great deal lots of knowledge and understanding has been a, an accumulation and not just mine and David's uh, knowledge it's come from an accumulation of 12 other people of right. which uh, Steve I wear the Liverpool legends in there. We've got yeah. uh, a rugby league coach. I'm sure David will elaborate a little bit more about him. He was absolutely diamond. And then there's a, there's a martial artist teacher. He's an ex-PE teacher, actually. He taught David and my, my daughter, Catherine, who then finished his teaching and then went in and opened a, a world champion, world champion gym. So, it was uh, it, it, it was uh, and has been a, a super experience. So we started it in May. Oh, the plan came out in May, the back end of May actually, and then we started to build up uh, a, a portfolio, if you like, of of, of information. Where we were going to put it, it wasn't we didn't really have that. It, it just it was it just organic in nature, and David just let loose with it. Uh, he had that poetic license and uh, it came out, you know, so we started actively doing some work. Our first interview was it with a, a black Premier League manager called, uh, it, 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 was, it was brilliant. Uh, we interviewed him and that was the fourth of uh, a guy called Darren Moore, who, who was at West Brom right. at that point, now the current Doncaster Rovers manager. Uh, so the fourth of, 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 of July... 
And then the book came out on the 27th of November. Uh, and it's been a number one bestseller in the UK uh, for, for quite a lengthy period of time. So it's obviously hitting some sweet spots. But as I say, I've been a, I've just been a support act. And I, I leave that, you know, my, my son has played a, a super, super role in it. And without him, it would never have got done. So, so yeah, no, no, knowing you, Keith, as I do, uh, very well, uh, David. Uh, Fifteen years of thought from 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 your dad uh, turned into five months of productivity <laughs> from your good self. Uh, elaborate on that one for me, please, David. Yeah, it, um, obviously the idea was there, um, right. and I think I, I know a lot of people probably would like to write a book, have the idea of a book in the head. And I was no different with that. Um, and when, uh, when my dad mentioned it to me, I, it was a, it's a no brainer really. Um, so <clears throat> from that point, it was just a case of, <coughs> pardon me. Um, it was a case of the collection of information. Uh, we knew what the book, what we wanted it to be about. Uh, we knew the direction, but it was, how do we get to that end product? Um, and it, we actually touch on it in the book of it process over content. Uh, we know what we want at the end, but what are the steps uh, on the way? And like my dad mentioned, we started, we started putting plans and ideas. I mean, it was a lot of note taking on my phone. There'd be something pop into my head or into my dad's head, it going into the phone, into the notes and, um, it was it was at the end of July. That's when really the the writing started happening. Um, there was a lot of transcribes from from interviews that were taking place, from um, stuff that we'd seen and observed, and obviously, like my dad mentioned, from our own knowledge and experiences too. Um, and we spent. I mean, I, I know in particular I did. I, I Starbucks. They must have loved me. They would have loved me because I I was in there pretty much every day. Um, so as well as the, the work that I was doing, I would be in Starbucks and I had my own table that was reserved. They might as well have put a sign on the table saying David's, uh, David's table. And I was in there every day, I, numerous, numerous hours. There was times where I'd be in, in Starbucks for seven or eight hours. And um, I, 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 it was happening. The book was happening. And, and the only way it was going to get done was if we really committed to it and we wanted it to be the best possible book it could be. And all the time that was spent in in Starbucks and, and outside of Starbucks, actually doing the, the work itself, um, gathering the information was well worthwhile. So yeah, four months after four months after starting writing it, um, it like my dad mentioned, it got released. And that was, I, I mean, I, I'm proud of, of things that I've done. Um, there's, there's things both as a as a player and as a coach that I've achieved that I'm I'm very proud of. But I think you know releasing the book was a really proud moment. Um, probably the proudest one was was when I went onto Amazon a, about a day and a half after the book got released and it was a number one bestseller. And I I almost fell over. I couldn't. I mean, to it's not something that I would have ever imagined really at the start of last year you go oh, you, you're going to write a book and it'll be a bestseller but it within a day and a half it was and like my dad mentioned it sat there as a i've been read the book i can understand why uh because it grips you to start with with, with, with the opening um the opening topic of the lone wolf story which which got me straight into it and continued to read um just uh, tell, tell tell our um, uh, our followers and listeners the lone wolf story. If you can touch over that briefly, it, it's terrific. Yeah, so I, I'm very fortunate where I I coach at Liverpool Academy. I'm part time there, uh, but after 37 years of coaching or it's 30, 35 years back then, actually. But it was it, it was an experience where we came across a player and and the, the you know, a, a young boy who, who really speaks. In fact, he didn't say anything. And so, you know, it was, was it for me to then fix him or look to fix him or get him to communicate? Was it for me or was it for him? 
I, I didn't know it was comfort. He was comfortable with it all, but you know, because they don't communicate and say anything to us, it doesn't mean they're actually not listening. What they can do is communicate in different ways, and this young boy, he communicates through his action. So, the longer story of it, uh, Rich, chapter one, the lone wolf, uh, sort of came about by having some contact with his mum uh, or his parents and finding out a little bit more about the boy. And, you know, I think as coaches, we think it is about ball, bib, cone, grass, player, which does play an important part of your coaching soccer. But there's something beyond that, something greater than that. And so having, uh, having the contact with the parents, I actually found out a little bit more about the boy and you know, I spoke to the mother and it was Christmas time uh, and just finding out whether they'd had a nice Christmas really, just connecting with them and yeah, the Christmas was fine and I was just inquiring about him. Is he okay? Yeah. But I wanted to find out a little bit more. I didn't know where the conversation was going to take me and neither did I feel at that point the profound impact that it's had on my life as a consequence to making that, to making the call was, I found out a little bit more about the family and the, the contact was, you know, do you have any, do you have, to the mum, do you have any more children? She said, yeah, I've got five. Okay, where is John in this, in terms of he's the youngest, eldest, where is he? And he's, he was the baby. Uh, but what was the light bulb moment was, He's the baby, but he was a twin. And the twin did all the talking for him in school. And that was a real, real impacting moment for me because it was then, do I spend more time trying to help his sister to help John? Uh, but it then gave me an insight to why he's genuinely quiet. It might have been. I mean, there's, there's obviously other reasons. So... I've been coached a long time. I got off the phone and I, I had a moment and I don't, I don't, I don't, you know, I'm not being, uh, uh, I can share it. I had, I had a moment and it was an emotional moment because it, it, it was, it was huge for me. He is, I used to think it was about the ball, bib, cone and that one on the grass. And in actual fact, it got me to, to feel a little, think a little bit deeper is it, it's not, it, it's, there's a lot more going on before you can get somebody to, elaborate and show and display the the talents we have to make them feel at home and at ease so the little case study that i did with this young, young boy uh helped me to define what i stand for and, and, and really what it is and so we call it the lone wolf in, in essence it, that was a chapter about me my little journey because coaching is a lonely place isn't it at times you know we, we got we're, we're delivering little messages the silent whispering and we're postmen of information where we're delivering information and some of it's junk mail and some of it's worth registering and taking on board and a real powerful you like an epiphany it was a extremely powerful uh, experience for me so it had to go into the book and it had to go in a specific place, and it's if it's the intro, you know, it helps people to go on a different journey of who we are and what we are as coaches. That's and that emotional point that you mentioned as well. So, David, following on that, sharing that experience with your dad, your dad obviously um, telling you those stories, and uh, you're a younger version of your dad now. Sorry, Keith. Uh, Having witnessed that firsthand um, in the criteria, the importance of those connections, how do you see that and, and, and deliver that working with, you know, in your environment right now as a, an evolving first class coach? Yeah, I think there's a lot said about um, technical and tactical aspects of the game. Sure. Um, people. People cover that, and 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 some of it's fantastic. There's some great stuff out there um, that covers the technique and the, the tactics that go into making um, groups and individuals successful. But 
Um, in reality, I think that that connection and, and the ability to build um, solid relationships with your players is is more important because you could have all the knowledge in the world. Um, you could be technically, you could be first class. Tactically, you could be first class. But if you aren't able to build a solid relationship with the players that you're working with, really all you've got is your opinion. And if they don't like you, right. there's... <laughs> there's not much chance that they're really going to be that interested in what you're saying anyway. And I think to, to truly be effective, you have to understand where the, where the player is at to an extent you, you've got to do some digging and, and find out where the player is at on their journey right now. And, and at times you have to, you have to enter um, the world on their terms, because obviously this is about the players that you're working with. It's, we're, we are here as coaches to help those players and you you can enter the world on enter a model of the world on their terms so that you know where they're at you can have or you can have a better idea of where they're at and I mean ways that you can do it you look at and, and it, it we touch on it in the book it's pacing before you lead um, because yeah to lead somebody you have to have an understanding of where they are anyway and Pacing is when you aim to match, whether it be the language, uh, the experiences, the beliefs, the values uh, that, that another person shares in order to, to build a relationship. And it, it could be something so simple as a, a player walks in the building and you just want to find out who's your favourite player. And right. they say, my, well, my favourite player is Messi. And I, for me, I go, oh. My favourite player is Messi too. I, I love it. And straight away, there's a similarity. And it's not to say that that one little conversation builds up this huge relationship, but it's an ongoing thing of you're aiming to, to find out where they're at. You're aiming to find out what it is they may like, find out what it is that, that gets the juices flowing, that ticks the boxes for them in order to then lead and really positively influence them from where they are now to, to where they can be moving forward. Um, I've got a, I've, I've got a two, two sided question here. The first one is for you, uh, just continuing with you, David. So let's say, you know, a new group's come mm -hmm. in, you know, you're working with, you know, select an age group. It, it really doesn't matter from, from, from eight to 12 year olds, right through to maybe seniors, David. Mm -hmm. um, once you've, you know, delivered your session, um, what what would you do knowing that you're going to work with them again on a on a, a consistent basis? What would you do taking out away from that first session to do maybe some homework into getting to know those players? Because getting to know an individual uh, in a group, um, enhancing that through the group is difficult. What, what would you do to... Um, find out you know the homework basis on that to set those foundations for that connection absolutely so there's there's different stakeholders that's involved in this so uh, the players are a stakeholder uh, right the club the maybe the previous coach that they've worked with um, but parents and guardians they're huge they're a huge part of it of, of what's going on in in these players journeys and for me I think if you can do the homework before do it if if it's a group that's um, already been within your club and there's a coach that's working with them why don't you go find out something about them and it and it's not to say that that everything that comes through but it can paint a picture for you and you can spend time observing and watching um, and and off the back of what you said with the sessions I what I actually did um, I actually took over a, a group in in January. Uh, a, a good and it was on the 14 team they're a good side and I knew nothing the coach actually left he, he, he took a, a job at a pro club so I stepped in I actually at the time didn't have a, a team and I've stepped in and took the, took the group I didn't know anything and when I say anything I didn't know the first thing about these kids because I'd, it was just thrown upon me um, and I had we actually for me I took over the team on the Monday and we had a tournament coming up on that weekend and I, I didn't even know the names and I 
I went to it was overdrive. I went into it was overdrive. It was overtime with parents. I, I used the parents as my allies. Um, just find out a little bit about the kids, and it was it, something so simple. What family? What's the family life? If you know, because um, I. I didn't know some of the kids, they were actually living with guardians. Uh, there were five kids that were getting brought to practice by um, by a family friend because they couldn't get there on their own. And those things were really important for me to know. And I I, I was able to use that and I've been able to to use that information. Um, but I, I, I went, because I it's a great question, I, like I mentioned. I've experienced it within the past few months. And it wasn't, it's not an easy process because you have to learn really quickly. Um, but I, I knew that I had to do that in order to build a good relationship with the kids. And um, I also, when I look, when I address the kids, um, I let it be known and I'm consistent with it from the start that I want them to have a good experience. And I told them that I'm here in this role to give those kids a, an enjoyable experience, but a, and also a, a good learning environment. And um, I, I also told, look, mistakes happen. I'm okay with mistakes because they happen. You watch, you watch Messi, you watch Ronaldo. They make mistakes, and I'm okay with it. Um, and I also have clear guidelines around the the work ethic because things like that are, are very important. But you've got to dig into the stakeholders, whether it is a previous coach, whether it's information that the club holds, whether it is parents, whether it's another another player on the team. Uh, and what, what we're doing, not currently, because obviously we can't with, with the unfortunate circumstances that are going on around the world, um, what we do uh, at our club and, and we will be doing moving forward even more is in the lead up, at the back end of the season, in the lead up to the next season, the new coach, we're going to have them working alongside the current coach just to get to know the players. So they're not they're not under any pressure to coach and deliver sessions. They're just there to add little tips, to walk around and ask the kid a question, to maybe go on, onto the sideline and ask the parents a question just to find out how they're doing. Um, and I think it's huge. It's very, very important to do that. That that transition there, David, it, it is is from coach to coach. In that transition, they're actually uh, doing their, their pre homework, but they're setting those foundations in in, yeah. in the homework process. Keith, I'm going to ask you: Would would you like David was just then in at the deep end? Here's your team. Get on with it. Um, similar to you um, with your coach education programs over, and your world renowned Keith um, uh, on several continents. You're going to come in at the deep end, delivering those education courses and those programs, not knowing the coaches. Would you apply the same scenario to those um, new incoming coaches, developing coaches, uh, as you would a team with the foundations of, you know, in the book Gold Dust, the same scenarios? I think I think they're just going to flow organically, to be fair, Rich, and the. For sure, whenever I'm actually in, I'm very fortunate to have coached on six continents of the planet. I think the you really never truly know who's sat in the, in the room. Right. Um, I've had doctors, you know, I've had your plumber, your bricky. You've just got to be able to associate to what's actually in front of you. And I think if you come at it from that perspective, you're, you're being true to who you are. I think you're trying to be... Yeah. You're trying to be bigger than what you are. You're going to have an issue. There'll be somebody who'll put you down and will sort you out. Right. So it's important to to know who you are and be grounded with that. And then, you know, the the applications and the strategies that we use either consciously or the, or otherwise. If we if we apply the connection, I always make it. I always make it. It's not always possible, but I can have a I can have thirty candidates. Uh, male and female in a classroom and I, I at the end of the day I would pretty much have remembered every sim every single I might miss one name but I will remember everybody's name I think the choice of the use of the word or, sorry the use of the, the name just personalizes it 
Yeah. So when you're actually uh, when you're engaging with the candidates and you're you're up there, they're actually checking to see whether you know you're, what you're talking about. One, two, people are tight taking copious notes uh, yeah. and really don't do anything with it. And then you get the ones who ask questions, take copious notes, and are action. They do do every. They do what's asked. They'll sure. adapt and adopt. Or sorry, they adopt things and then yeah. they'll adapt it to meet the needs. But to connect with them to connect with the audience, to connect with the players, to connect with people we don't know, we've got to find out about them. They're actually coming out, they're coming to yeah, to gather information and corral that, but it's how we do it. You know, we've got to be, when we're in front of players that we don't know, we've got to be very careful about trying to become the Billy Big because you get shot down. It's not really what it's about. It's about them wanting to get something from the experience, not for the ego enema of the person in front of them, the coach, male or female, to actually, uh, you know, display uh, attributes of the, knowing everything. And I think yeah. if you engage at their level, you know, there are, there, you're going to get candidates, people who have got questions. You've got to embrace those. And if you don't know, you don't know the answer. You've got to give them their honest, I don't know, but... I will help to find that out. You've got to follow that through because they don't forget things. Right. So the integrity and the congruence of your message has got to come through the, from, the, from the right place, and that's from your heart, from your head, and from your gut. Yeah. So, you know, when you're connecting, it's, it, it's a, a simple strategies, but we've got to pay attention because the information's on the outside of us. All we've got to do is, even though we're, when we're coaching, we've got we've got a purpose, we've got a strategy, we've got uh, we've got a, 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 a program to follow. You sometimes got to you got to use your you got to be bright, you got to you got to be bespoke, and you got to think on your feet. Of course, or you stick by structure. Structure is okay to a degree, but if it's not working, then we have to realign. We have to readjust, either strip things back. Or we actually kick it on, so we don't have to go from, you know, uh, point one to point two to point three to. If they're ready for point five, hit them, because we don't know what players already know. We don't have to do that process. And I, I think because it's a waste in time. We we we're not on the planet a long time. Let's get to the point quickly. I think we waste it. So helping to connect with them quicker does help to you know to to move them along and while they're doing that their unconscious mind when they when people shut down on us rich their conscious mind will they will consciously criticize the presenter the content might be brilliant right but when you connect with people at a different level and some people are naturally very very good at it the audience, the players will, their, their unconscious mind will less critically analyze what's taking place. It doesn't mean they'll agree with you. It just means they'll comply with what's, what you're actually doing. So you're allowing, the, you're allowing them freedom rather than shutting them down and trying to be something that you're not. So we've got to be careful. It's a, a communication's a big area and it's a, it's a huge influence because unless we build connection with something or someone, yeah, you know, marriages break down because people don't connect. Footballers, right. we fall out with footballers, or they fall out with us, or because we've, we've lost connection. And, and we're not saying it's flower in your mouth all the time because it isn't. It's real. But whilst they're with us, let's you know, let's throw the only branch out there and work with them. And they're working with us, but we've got to work with them and be more receptive to that because. They'll get you'll get more from it. It's a, it's, a, it's a wonderful experience working with players. Keith, w w once you make that connection, you know you set the foundations. Um, you, know, you used a fantastic phrase, uh, which I'm I'm going to steal off you for ah. some of our presentation. So you know, tapping into that valve. Can, yeah. Can, uh, okay. what, do you, what do you mean? What do you mean? <laughs> there? Right. Uh, okay. So. If you get a, a master boiler maker, let me. Can I share a story with you? I'll show you. Yeah, go ahead, Keith. 
So we, we've got a multi, multinational company who've the, one of the boilers break down and they, they ring a master boiler maker up and he goes down, he's got a little hammer and little hammer and he's got his, he's got his span and in he goes and uh, he gets his familiarization, goes to the head of engineering, gets it all sorted, this is what's happening. It, boiler four keeps breaking down, it's intermittent, we need to get it sorted. So the master boiler maker goes around with his hammer and his and his spanner and he there's three valves and he opens one valve taps on it goes over to valve three partly opens it and taps it gently and then he goes to valve two and opens it all the way and then taps it heavily he then goes back to all the valves and opens them up fully although valve two is already open and they have no issues. It's gone. He's the best part of an hour, 45 minutes, and then he sends in his invoice. His invoice is for $10,000. Right. It's a lot of money. Right. But it's a multinational company, so we're talking, we're talking corporate figures. And so the head of engineering looks at his invoice. He said, yeah, listen, this is expensive. It's only a year, best part of an hour. You better get hold of him. So they get hold of the master boiler maker and they ring him up and he, he says, listen, I'm just around the corner, I'll, I'll come in. I'm going to explain, I'll, break, I'll give you a breakdown of the, uh, my invoice. So he said, look, look the, uh, yeah, uh, the, so the head of engineering, he, he then sits him down and he, he said, look, I, I don't need to sit down. I'm, I'm okay, I'll, I'll be all right. I'll only be here a minute. He said, I'll tell you why the, what the breakdown is. He said, it's, 50 cents on the hammer and the spanner and 9999 cents 999 dollars and 50 cents on knowing where to tap that's what coaching is about you can have all the practices and you can have all the nice fancy little drills but unless you're tapping at the right time with the right player at the right moment in the right space, in the right context, all that, having all the tools irrelevant. Right. But it goes deeper than that, Rich, because it's knowing when you open the valve, it's knowing how to tap it. You tap it gently and you tap it hard. And that's, that's a skill and it's an art. So practice designs are crucial. Organisation is crucial. Managing the groups is it, it, it's massively important but in terms of when you use your knowledge that in itself takes time and so I would implore all and everyone that's actually listening on this to find someone who is a who they deem to be a tremendous ex exemplar in the field whether it be whatever sport in this case, it's soccer, football over here in the UK. That's what we call it. And grab hold of their shirt sleeves and don't let them go. Pepper them. But that person's got to be the right person or people. You might have more than one. They'll, they're not going to tell you what you like to listen to. And equally, they've, they've gone through a school of, of hard knocks where they've, they've, they've worked at grassroots at the younger levels and then gone on to coach at a higher level or older players. So search them out. They're out there. We have a, a website for those interested where we we have a mentoring process or a mentoring program where we're going to do some coach education or mentoring. So that's I think that's probably what you're alluding to. Uh, yes. Yeah, it, 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 it's almost a gift, isn't it, Keith? Do you, do you think? And, and, and picking your right time and that moment, as you say, is a learning process and that feedback. Where, where does that feedback come from, uh, Keith? The player, the parents, both? Hmm. When you refer to feedback, just, just elaborate. You, what, what do you mean by that? What's your question? Tap, you've tapped into the, vol, uh, the valve with the player, yeah, uh, and, and tapping into that uh, valve as well with with the parents. The you know the big picture, um, that feedback coming coming back at you to evolve. Yeah. yeah. So 
No, that so this so this again. There, there ain't no right or wrong in this game. What you right. got to do is make sure it works. Yeah. So you might do things and it fails, but then if you continue to do the same thing, right. you always gotcha. do what you've always done. You'll always get yeah. what you've always got. So it, there's things that you we will do and it, it doesn't work. So it's not work with the feedback. So the feedback can be through a question of the player. Uh, right. But as David alluded to, we got stakeholders in this. So when you bring in a parent, there's times when I've actually been delivering sessions and I've gone over to the parents and I've actually told them what we're doing. This is what we're doing. And this right. is the reason why I'm doing it, because we want them on board. Whether they be going yeah. away and asking questions, or what did you do tonight, son, or sweetheart? Yeah. Or, well, if you, if you bring them into the party and you, you know, ask and if they've got any questions, parents, feel free. I'm my my phone's always my number's always well say it's always accessible. It's not, but for sure, if you got questions and and, it, and it's coming from the right source, I'm more than I won't run away from any questions that any parent asks me. One thing I will always never be afraid of asking the question. Right. And I will tell them this. So we're teeing it up and we're framing things up before we start. Never be afraid of asking. Sure, but I'm because I'm not be afraid of telling you what you would what what, what I'm, don't be afraid of the response. So you've got to be very mindful of what you ask. So when when you get that, it then becomes it then becomes uh, you know, more. Uh, it becomes we've got partners in it, and then what we're going to have is the feedback that you give to the players. You're asking them questions, and then you're aiming to get a response. But not accepting just the answer, you've got to. So when we ask questions, we want to make sure that when they give us the information, the answer, their their response, we have got an answer in return, just in case it isn't the appropriate answer. It, we've got to guide them and help them on this journey. Sure, sure. Hey, um, want to get straight back onto the book, but. Uh, if we can, uh, David, I'll start with you first, mate. Can you give us a little bit of uh, background in terms of, you know, your playing, your, your playing career, and uh, the link between UK, US? If you can uh, enlighten us on that one, David. I can. <clears throat> so um, I know our mine and my dad's path; they're both incredibly similar. Um, so right. I, I played in in England. Um, <laughs> I was at Wigan, and I think that's the dog. The dog's at the. I think the dog's trying to get in. That's fine. Dog's joining in, Richie. He's trying to get his. He wants his moment of fame. Um, yeah, no, I, I played played in England. I, I was at Wigan. And, um, I also played in Spain, um, and then at, at, at I think we eight nineteen, um, I had a, a choice to make. Uh, could have stayed at home. Could have signed professional and with with. I could have signed professionally at the club and it just didn't feel right. I'd already had, I'd had a lot of injuries and the way I looked at it was if I, I signed, you sign a one year contract and you get injured or things don't go to plan, then what do you do? And I, I'd seen a lot of people that had done that, a lot of players that had done that where they'd signed a one year contract and things didn't work out. And within a year they weren't playing anywhere at all. They weren't even, they, they weren't playing the game at any level. And right. It, it didn't feel right for me. And, and knowing obviously the injury issues I had, I always felt that I needed a backup plan, um, which in turn took me to, to move into the States. So I, I played in college, um, moved over in 2011, played, played Akron uh, for my freshman year, played with some incredible players. There's, I think there's about six, seven who've represented their own national teams. Um, one of them who's, uh, one of my best friends is he's captain the US national team now. Um, so really played with some great players there. Um, and then trans played the transfer to Charlotte, UNC Charlotte, and spent the rest of my college time at Charlotte. And I think even through college, I had a lot of injuries. Um, some of them were, were I think, genetic that, that I, was, I was born with. Um, others were just freak accidents where you'd uh, I'd fall <laughs> and end up with a broken arm. And it was it was freak accidents. And yeah. And over the back end of the back end of my college career I was was actually the one of the top 
uh, what was I was getting drafted into the MLS. We we knew what was going on. We'd obviously spoke to the club and uh, w- was gonna go pretty high in the draft, which was really exciting, um, especially after having a degree out of it as well. And right at the end of my senior year, got injured, and I was out for eleven months, so I I missed the draft uh, because I couldn't get cleared to play through because through the doctors. Um, so missed the draft and. Um, at that point, I, en- I ended up, uh, I took coaching a little bit more seriously, um, with, still with the intention of playing. And I actually moved back to England at that point um, with the opportunity to go into a, a pro club in England and couldn't wait for it. Was really excited. And, and in that off season, um, before going into the club, I, I had the B li- my UA for B license, which I was completing. And... Um, uh, my dad was actually there and I remember hitting a ball and I just felt something in my hip and I'd had a lot of issues with my hip over the years and I hit a ball and I knew something wasn't right and um, day after I saw a, a specialist and it long story short it turned out that I needed I needed hip surgery and the, the hip surgery itself I was 25 years old um, I I'd, the surgeon said, "Look, we can you can have the surgery. You may be able to play again. We don't know." And that was that was three years ago. I've never never played since. Um, never will play again. And I, I can I can jump in, and I'm still good to do the demos. Uh, I've, I've I've seen your demos, Dave. They're not bad. They're not they're bad. Right. There's some work. There's a bit of improvement, but now the I can still do my demos. Um, I couldn't play. I mean, I've. I've done no. a little bit of a, a five-a-side and I can't walk yeah. for a week afterwards. Um, so, look, I, do I do I think that if I hadn't have had the injuries, I would have still been playing and playing at a high level? Absolutely, I would. Uh, there was no doubt in my mind that I would have played at a, at a, at a very high level even sure. back in England. And I, I truly believe that. But um, obviously what happened was I, I, wasn't meant to, I wasn't meant to do that. And, yeah. and because yeah. I was coaching and... And um, my dad was coaching that the experiences and, and things I'd learned through through my dad and through watching, um, I was able to take that on my journey. And it's it has took me to I've I've myself now um, I've now coached on on four different continents. I've been really fortunate that I was actually I've, the club that I work at. I we have a, a base in Africa as well. Um, sure. So I've I've been to Tanzania and done stuff there, which was unbelievably humbling um to 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 experience that with with people that have very little to nothing um and that's it it really sets it it hits home for you when you see that but i i've coached on four continents and um i am now back in the u.s i'm coaching in the u.s i'm based in utah uh, right and like i said the, the club that i work at we we are based in utah we're based in africa um we're also based in um in the in the UK too, so yeah, it's been a it's been an interesting journey from playing um, through to coaching. But I I love what I do. I really do enjoy it, and and I'm really fortunate that I've been able to have the experiences I've had and to continue having them. Just 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 uh, yeah, quick. I was going to say just quickly, David, give us give a shout out to because uh, you live next door to me, Colorado, Utah. Just yeah. give a big shout out to your crew back 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 in. Uh, Salt Lake, mate. I will. I will. Yeah, they've the the, the club. So Seven Elite Academy. We've it's a relatively new club um, that got got formed. We're in our second season now. So obviously, there's there's been a lot of interruptions within that second season. But we've got yeah. some really good people here, and we're looking to do some some good things. And uh, they're they're already taking place. They're already taking place, and I think there's a lot of growth to be had in Utah. Um, and sure. and we're uh, we're on the path to to helping that and making that happen and growing the growing the sport, growing the game, and and giving players even better experiences. Brilliant, hey, hey Keith. Uh, if if we could just uh, uh, we'll get back to the book, of course. Uh, but uh, if you can uh, briefly touch on, you know, your career. Um, pretty much runs level with mine when television was just purely back black and white and one channel, Keith. Oh, dear. Right. So, oh, dear. 
Well, that, that's back in 1982, Rich. I, as David, he's had this parallel connection. We've got lots of similarities. So back in, oh, the, oh dearie me. <laughs> Where have got these images from? Secret, Keith. Secret. Uh, so, yeah, David's, I'd say, so back in 1982, I, I went to college in, in New Jersey and we won the national championships. Played over in the UK. An ex, I played an ex pro, uh, but got injured and didn't make any money out of the game. I signed professional forms, and then what do you do? Uh, you know, I, I'm a, a lad comes from a very humble, a very humble uh, background where my dad, my mum worked hard. They were my dad was a builder, my mum was a mill worker. Right. Uh, came from a council estate, and you know so. I got in, football was my life, and uh, I got injured, so I partially tore a middle collateral ligament. Oh, so yeah. lots of injuries, uh, and then you know my body wasn't it, it, it wasn't for full time football. It kept breaking down, hamstring, groins. Same thing as what David, uh, or David got the same thing as what I had. So you know, over to the states, played. Had a wonderful time in New Jersey. I went to a two-year college, Mercer County Community College, whereby we that, that image of my, that where I got the shorts on my, my uh, Kevin Keegan shorts. I was going to say, mate, yeah, yeah, with a bit of an uh, I, I had her back then, but uh, yeah, wonderful, <laughs> wonderful times. Just yeah, fantastic experience, which have all accumulated to you know to where I am currently and. I take all of those experiences. I, I'm, I'm a, I know we're living in these uncharted waters at the moment where the times are unprecedented what we're going through, but this isolation stuff, I, I, I'm very comfortable with it. So that takes me back to, to 82. And then after that, I got into coaching and I, uh, you know, I got my level two coaching award back in 1980. It was 82, actually. And then... In 84, I did my, it's called the A-Lac, it's called the UEFA, it's, it's called the full badge. But right. then, uh, it's now the UEFA a -Lash. So in 84, I failed it, but that wasn't, I'm not accepting failure at all. I loved it. I, I loved everything that it brought to my life and still does. It connects a lot of dots for me without football or without the youngsters in, you know, that I have associated and I work with. They make I'm, you know, I feel like I'm 26, 28. I yeah. really do. They they bring it alive for me, and you know, their image of me working at at, at a fantastic academy, uh, <clears throat> where I'm part of a cog. I play a mini mini part, but I play a part. Has been uh, it's been great. It's filled loads of dots, and it still continues to do so. So, uh, so in, in, in 1985, I passed my, my U, UEFA air license. And then I got into, I worked at, uh, directed an independent centre of excellence for the FA, our football association. Then I, yeah. were, then I went over to Leeds United, part-time, of course. And of course, you'll know the people there, Paul Hart and okay. other people yeah. like you, Nick Marshall, who's a tremendous, tremendous people. Good uh, lads. Yeah, I really. Uh, so I went from Leeds United and then went down to Nottingham Forest and spent the best part of just eight and a half years down there. Part time, traveling two hours. This is how much you can get when you're coaching, isn't it? You, I, it just take me two hours to do an hour and a half session. Now, That's... two hours in the States might not sound a lot, but in the UK, traveling, if you go 30 minutes, you're getting a nosebleed. So I, <laughs> uh, when they became academies, uh, I got offered the uh, uh, an assistant academy role full-time at Nottingham Forest to, to, to take the 12-14s, uh, sorry, 12-16s. to 16s. And uh, I, I didn't take it. Uh, I didn't because it was, yeah, the money wasn't right. And I was quite, my wife had a good job and I have a business. So I, I, I did it part-time. Sure. And then uh, I got offered a, uh, the the ante was in the the ante a couple of years about a season yeah about a season afterwards the the up the ante the money was a lot better uh, but my mum was my mum was dying 
uh, cancer and it was uh, it's family. But there's it's no yeah. brainer. It's so Good. football took a backward step and I I don't I don't regret ever going into football full time. I've never been in football full time at a club. Although I live my life around football and you know, I've I've delivered the pro license courses uh, or course in South Korea with a great friend and colleague who with a book's dedicated to it's it's uh, dedicated to a guy called Dick Baird. I was going to ask you to touch on Dick. I didn't mean to interrupt you, Keith, but yeah. I, I, a very important pioneer and a legend. Yeah, like yourself. Yeah, Keith. well, yeah, I don't know about that, but oh, yeah, ah. Mm. Do you want wow. to give a brief why you're on your, your, your coaching, Keith? Just give yeah, everyone. yeah. yeah. So, so anyone, yeah. anyone? Oh dearie. Uh, yeah. So, so Dick Bird, as you say, he was a maverick. I'd known him. He'd been in my life thirty-five years. Uh, never known a man or woman. Never known him to speak badly about man or woman. He he did. He directed. Our air license courses. Uh, he he built our academy managers courses, and of course, he he delivered many, many, many times over in the US. And he just stands out. His detail, his demeanour, the way he presents himself. But yet, all of that behind it was a private man and a you know, a shy man. Uh, right. Yeah, an extremely bright man, and. And so, you know, we uh, I'm the last one ever to see Dick work live. You know, we were in South Korea in 2017 delivering this pro license for the for the Asian Football uh, Association. And, uh, he, you know, there's only Dick and myself. We used to have a, a, another colleague of ours called Gary Phillips, sports science, who's a wonderful guy, Gary. And right. uh, so... You know, when we came, when I was in South Korea with Dick, he, he said, "Listen, I'm, I'm forgetting things. Do you think?" And I said, "Well, look, you, it, this is we're tired, Dick. It's July, South Korea, by the way. In July, it's it's unbelievably hot and immense, uh, unbelievable amount of humidity. You could walk 25, 30 yards, you wet through. So, absolutely, we're tired. I can't answer your question fully, but well, let's get home and let's get some sleep." properly you know so because you're a workaholic so anyway story short came back and you know dick uh, he rang me two weeks after getting back from south korea and uh he said listen i've i've got a uh, i think i've got a vitamin deficiency which was great I thought, well, well that's all right and he thanked me for the conversation that we had in south korea and then three weeks later his wife maggie then contacted me and she texted me she said can you contact dick and she it was it was uh, a capital letters contact him urgently. We think he's got a suspected brain tumor. So I did. I couldn't get through. I couldn't get through. Uh, he's obviously still in hospital. But then when he came out, he said to me, I've got a, I think I've got a brain tumor, but we'll find out during the week. Anyway, story short, he, uh, yeah, he passed in, uh, in May. Uh, sorry, he passed in 2018. And so what we did is, uh, you know, we dedicated the book to Dick, and it, it's when he uh, when he passed. He, uh, a part of me went with him, to be honest, uh, Richie. Uh, part of my life went with him because I we had so many immense, tremendous conversations about life, not just football. He was a you know, he was a pathfinder of his of his of his time, and. Uh, uh no, I, I know that's quite for you to talk about, Keith. But, but thank you so much on on that on that personal note from from me and everybody else. I uh, I did uh, I did do my A license with with, with Dick um, at Lily Shull, and uh, he was an officer and a gentleman. So, Keith, I, I just want to pass on so, so, certainly from from myself. Thanks for sharing that moment. I know it's been that. Can short. I just thank something about that, Richard? Because I mean, it, for, for the in regards to the, the books dedicated to Dick, but yeah. 10% of the profit from yeah. the book goes to the Giles Trust, which is the brain tumour fund that looked after my friend in his latter days of life. Super. So, you know, the book's a good book. 
I, I'm, yeah. yeah, I think you know me well enough. I, I don't, I, I don't want to get my name or I, I, I you know, I'm the, you know, I don't, I don't know whether I, I want to look after our name. My name's important to me, so briefly, so, you know, I don't want people buying the book because it's sentimental value. It has value, but it, but it's massively important. It gives a great deal back to a, a wonderful charity. Uh, as well, so I, I, it's important that I share that with. Of course, with. of course, gentlemen. I've got a thousand questions to uh, to ask you, uh, yes, but um, I'm going to ask you two re uh, real personal questions. I know you co 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 wrote the book. Um, question at both of you, one each. Um, you, you, you end, Dave, David. David, I'll, I'll, I'll go with you first. Mm -hmm. You, you, you. you your target for that book with, with, with delving into, you know, the inner depths of coaching that environment and, and building those relationships. What, what one massive point, the top point from you to, 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 to say to our audience today, mate. Yeah. Um, and I think, so there's, there's a quote in the book. It's actually mentioned, it's mentioned a couple of times and it's, it's my favorite quote. Um, obviously there's a lot, a lot of things that went into the book, but this quote, this is what the book is. This is what it's about. This is what we want to portray. Um, and it's the Maya Angelou quote of people may forget what you said. People, they may forget what you did, but they'll never forget how you made them feel. <clears throat> and I, for me, I just find that uh, it's such a powerful <laughs> quote because yes. I've experienced it. I, I've had experiences as a player where I didn't feel good about going to, to training or I didn't, feel good about playing um, and I don't want to subject my players to that so the people that I work with the players that I work with I want to do everything I can to give them an enjoyable um, learning environment that I can also make them feel good about what it is they do at the same time and my experiences along with along with obviously being around my dad for so long um, they're a big part of the fuel that, that built the fire really yeah. that got me to write and this book with my dad and it's not to say that I'm always going to get it right. Uh, and I may say, or I may do the wrong things at times, which I'm sure pretty much everybody will. Um, but my purpose with what I do with, with my job and with the people I work with is to make them feel good about what it is they do. And sure. when people feel good about what it is they do, you're more likely to get more out of them. Yeah, yeah. Um, and, and, you know, people can learn from positive and negative experiences, but people are more likely to learn when they're in an enjoyable and a positive environment. And, and I just find that, like I said, that the quote is, it sits deep with me. Um, it's the screen, uh, the screensaver, I think it's called, on my, my laptop. Um, it's on my phone. It's, it's everywhere. I, I live by that. That is the quote that I live by when I do things. Keith, the same at you. Same question, mate. I actually forgot the question. All right. About the one, book. In a nutshell, mate, one yeah, thing you want to achieve from the book. What? Yeah, I think what we have is the book have got the book's got some gems in there. Not not just from us. Uh, we're not being humble about it. I, I think we've we have we have we have had a collaboration and fortunately I've got some very good some friendships out the game. The game brings people together, doesn't it? That one ball brings so many lives together. So, yeah, I think an accumulation of all the knowledge and from the exemplars that are from within the book, uh, within the chapters from within the book, there'll be something that will be of a, it'll be a light bulb moment, and like that, it yeah. touches lots of lives. So I, I, I don't have. For me, my personal experience is, you know, when we're working with players, we're going to be paying attention to them. We we don't know what's happening in their life. We don't know whether, particularly now, we don't know whether the wives, are, the, the the parents have got, you know, they've lost the job, there's little money around. We, we don't know. We don't even know where they live. But yet they come into us and we're expecting it to be hunky-dory. Un, unky and i right. got to be careful. Be care for them because the players want three things rich we want three things they want three things from us they want to know that that we care for them that, that's one two 
They want to know that they can learn from us. If they'll know they can learn from us and we care for them, we've got half a chance. Right. But the most important one of the most important things is that can they trust us? And I just yeah. I just think so. Do they care? Do we care? Do they know that we care? Can they learn from us? And can they trust us? And the trust element takes time. So players want to know that they can get those three things. And sure. I call it the KFC. Be kind. Yeah. Be firm and fur with them. And care for them. Kind, fur and firm. And care for them. And if you're doing anything other than that, you shouldn't be coaching. Because it's not about you. It's about them. They're taking us on their journey. We are, all we are is a support act for them. And if you're thinking it's otherwise, you probably might need to look yourself in the mirror a little bit. Or read the book. Or buy the book. It's not, it's not rocket science. I get that, gentlemen. <laughs> I, uh, I'm going to, when I said I've got a thousand questions, I, I think about 700 of those have come up on my screen at the time from people that have been listening in. So uh, there's a couple of names out there. Michael Whiteley from Northern Ireland uh, said, hello, boys, ah, by the way. Michael. We've got a, um, uh, yeah, Michael Whitley. Yeah, top man. And we had, uh, uh, I think it was a Liana Crompton from P uh, Peoria in Illinois. You know, I'm going to apologize. There's many more. I'm going to apologize right now because we are short for time. I want to throw, uh, you're going to need to wear your shin guards for these lads because, uh, yeah, I picked up a few reds in my time. Uh, so uh, these are quick fire questions. A couple of good ones here for you. So if you, if you can answer as quickly as possible. <laughs> I think we've been through that story before anyway. So uh, we'll alternate. I'll start with you. First question, David. And uh, second question will go to Keith. But if you can answer the first one. Uh, David, what's um, what what's, what's your team, mate? What team do you support? I don't. Whoever's winning. <laughs> I'll take that as male and female, right? I'll, I'll leave that one with you. Yeah, England, we'll go with England. England. All right. Uh, yeah, I'll, I'll give you that one. Keith, uh, teammate. Teammate, no, what oh, I'll, I'll backtrack. Oh, team Liverpool, you support, mate. <laughs> I'm gonna say you, you're my team at Liverpool. What about the women's teams? Liverpool, there you go, great answer. Right, <laughs> um, up to, up to the year 2000, me and you've got to think back on there, Keith, haven't we? Mm -hmm. Yeah, du du dust it off, youth. Uh, up, up to the year 2000. Who is your favourite player, goalkeeper only? Oh, goalkeeper up only. To, up to up to two thousand. Two thousand, nothing beyond. Uh, I, Peter, it's, I've got to say Peter Benetti. Okay. I was Dave, I know you can go back. wasn't born then. Right. <laughs> uh, you know what? Because of his long ponytail, I'll go David Seaman. David Seaman. Peter Bonetti, legends. All right, quick one, tough one. Um, rule changes over the years. If you could change one now or put one back that's been taken out, what would it be, lads? Wow. One that's in and one that's out, I would... Uh, oh, Jesus, we need a little bit of thought. To, I, I would say... Uh, VAR. We need to change VAR. We need to be a little bit more refined. All right, so Dave. VAR has to be. There's got to be some alterations in there. I think that. I think that's the big one. We won't go into it now. <laughs> uh, Dave, uh, coach, uh, you admire the most, past or present? My dad. There you go. Brilliant. Easy. Keith. Dick Bird. Of course. Keith, best player you've ever played with? Uh, oh, now then. I'll have to come back with that one. I didn't play with many. Play with some kickers. I would say his name was Paddy Maha. Played at college with me in 1982. Irish lad. 
similar name, used to take all the goals in the, uh, when I scored goals, he used to take, uh, he used to get all the plaudits because we had a similar name, although we spelt the surname differently. Paddy Maha. You can explain that one to me next time I'm over in the UK. Okay, mate. Over the pie. Oh. All right. <laughs> David. Uh, I'm going to go with Two. I'm, I'm going to give you two. Will Trap. No. Go I'll let you go on. Right. I'll go Will Trap, um, yeah. who's captain of the national team. And I'm going to go DeAndre Yedlin, who's at Newcastle now. Thank you, gentlemen, for sharing those with me. Greatly appreciated. I want to thank you for your time. It's been a pleasure. I could have spent all day with you two. No problem. Uh, you probably couldn't spend all day with me. I get that. Um, I can't thank you enough for sharing the time, the stories, the book. It, 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 it's a revelation in coaching, in my opinion, for whatever that matters to everybody out there. You must buy it. It's a great cause. It's a great read. And um, God bless the Dick Bait. Thank you very much, gentlemen, for sharing your time. Thank you, Rich. Appreciate you having us. Thank you, Rich. Richie, can I just uh, have a big shout out for Anthony, by the way, behind the scenes, who's done Absolutely. such a terrific job here, mate. Mm. He, he, so, Anthony, thank you. You've been brilliant. And, and Rich, you've been a super host. So, thanks ever so much for creating this opportunity in space for us to be here. And I, I think as well, Rich, I, I just want to add on. I know we're going through unprecedented times. Uh, yeah. And I, I, I just, for anyone that's listening, that's, that's paying it, that, that's, that's paying attention to what's going on, I just hope that obviously football is a big thing and we want to get back on the grass as soon as possible. Uh, but I hope that, I, I just sincerely hope and wish that everybody stays safe and when the sure. time's right that we're... Uh, we're able to return back to the grass as safely as possible.